What's up, sons? It's Blind Drive with Simon Tech once again, and we have one of the most exciting releases for graphics cards in quite some time. I've been getting used to saying this for CPUs thanks to Ryzen, and once again, this is going to the AMD team for the Radeon RX 5700 XT. While there are still plenty of issues going around and some quirks here or there for drivers, it is one of the most promising cards that I've seen come out at this price point in quite some time. Now, the most exciting thing on paper is going to be that we are on a smaller 7 nanometer manufacturing process and that we have now finally gotten off the GCN architecture at Radeon and are on a new one called or referred to as RDNA. Aside from that, the price point puts it right there with your RTX 2070 Super and significantly under some of the cards it competes with depending on the situation, such as the GTX 1080 Ti and the RTX 2080 even. I even verified this with my own RTX 2080 that's currently underwater and it's pretty impressive stuff, especially if you're willing to tweak the card. So let's get into it. So starting things off, the GPU has 40 compute units, a base frequency of 1605 megahertz with a boost frequency of up to 1905 megahertz and a gain frequency of 1755 megahertz. Now, one of my biggest complaints with Vega was it not meeting advertised boost clocks. So I feel like they put this gain frequency in here purely for that fact. While on the Nvidia side, the boost frequency usually stays pretty consistent across testing, meaning that once it boosts up, it kind of sticks right there at that boost. The AMD or the Radeon GPUs, even on this 5700 XT, do fluctuate quite a bit. And between that 1755 and that 1905. Also, a big note here is when you're overclocking, the actual number you set in something like MSI Afterburner is going to be that up to boost frequency. So you're not actually going to see that translate to a direct direct full overclock um, in your games if you overclock it in Afterburner. For example, if you put 2100 megahertz, that boost frequency that you put in there is going to be the max boost frequency. So you'll see it pretty regularly drop below that. And you'll see that in some of my benchmarks when we get to it. Now it has 2560 stream processors, 160 texture units, and 10.3 billion transistors. The typical board power, which is not really TDP, it's TBP, and I wish they would do this a little bit different. Now in Radeon's defense, typical board power probably does reflect actual power because that's going to include your GPU core power, your memory power, and so on. While a TDP will typically, <laughs> get it? Your TDP will typically go ahead and mean that that's just the GPU core power. So it's a little hard to tell the difference between something like Nvidia when you're looking at these numbers and AMD. But the typical board power here is 225 watts. If you go ahead and do some tweaks like I posted uh, earlier this week, which you can check out, you can get it to use 250 watts on the GPU core power. So it'll go quite a bit above this. And you want to be careful when doing that, of course, because it will be out of spec. The power supply recommendation is going to be 640 watts. So keep that in mind. The memory speed is 14 gigabits per second and the max memory size is eight gigabytes. The memory type is GDDR6. The memory interface is 256 bit bus and max memory bandwidth is 448 gigabytes per second. So it's pretty impressive just from a, a specification standpoint. We'll have to see how that reflects later on. For connectivity, which is important for a lot of people, we are seeing them drop your DVI port, but you do have a 1.4 uh, display port with DSC and you have HDMI 2.0 with 4K 60 support across HDMI, as well as higher frame rate support for 1440p and of course 1080p. So let's get on to the benchmarks. For synthetic benchmarks, I did run this with the power play enabled because I found this to be super duper impressive. And I think that AMD could start unlocking this and it might tell us a little bit about what's coming up with the 
next Navi cards. With the power play tables in place, we saw a Time Spy score, a graphic score of 9,333, and a Fire Strike of, get this, 28,346, which is faster than my stock RTX 2080, while it's underwater, which should allow it to boost further. Um, it's insane. That's just crazy at this point that like a DX11 performance for this GPU is absolutely ridiculous. Now, Superposition 4K optimized was a 7,031. And then we start seeing some struggles here and there depending on the title. One of those is Final Fantasy 15, where we had a 1440p high score of 5,684, falling quite short of a lot of different cards within this price range. So if you're a Final Fantasy 15 fan, this might not be a GPU for you, you might want to look elsewhere. That being said, it's still respectable enough and my particular score did beat what their their standard uh, 5700 XT score was and this was without the overclocked as well as the superposition. The rest of these don't have the overclock. The only thing I overclocked was the Time Spy and Fire Strike because those you always kind of want to see those overclocked scores. Now Far Cry New Dawn 1440p Ultra. I wasn't really getting the numbers that everybody else was and so I thought it was important to bring this up. I was also getting frequent crashes. Now that is after we solved the stutter issues. If you guys have been following the channel, you know that I was having some stuttering and some serious problems with that while trying to test the 5700 XT. And that actually came down to a faulty motherboard. And once that was replaced, we went ahead and re-ran all of these numbers and went ahead and retested everything. That being said, the Far Cry New Dawn score didn't change. And while I'm not crashing, we are anymore, we are still getting pretty low numbers with mins of 56 and an average of 82. And I say low numbers because what's being reported around the internet for most other people, I seem to be on the low side of. And I'm not sure exactly why that is. It doesn't appear to be with any sort of faultiness in the GPU because we have one of the highest scores, of course, in Fire Strike. Now, Shadow of the Tomb Raider had performed very, very well, going back to the positives, with a min of 61 and an average of 78, which once again beats the RTX 2080 and the GTX 1080 Ti, which it shouldn't even be theoretically trading blows with. Devil May Cry 5 was another one they performed really, really well in with 0.1% lows of 55.3, 1% lows of 80.7, and an average of 150.5. Holy smokes, that's good, good numbers. So what do we have here overall? We have a mixed bag on the initial driver releases for the RX 5700 XT, including about a 10% dive uh, since the latest driver patch, but then we can get an extra 15% if we apply the soft power tables to unlock the full potential of the GPU. In summation there, what you're going to want to pay attention to is the fact that if you're going to pick up an RX 5700 XT, you have some amazing potential as long as you're the type of person that's willing to tweak, okay with not just starting up a game and going straight at it, and like playing with hardware. If that's not you and you just want to pop something in and not have to worry about it right now you still may want to go ahead and look over at the green team and that's just full honesty here at this point does that mean i don't like the 5700 xt no i enjoy it it's probably one of the most fun gpus i've had to play with in a long time probably since the fury series in my humble opinion and the potential is there to be basically a 1080 ti and rtx 2080 killer uh, for the price point if it can even keep up matching that and we start seeing the good performance in the games that it's optimized for start to flow down and trickle down to some of the older titles and uh, some of the other titles that it's not performing so well in like Final Fantasy 15. So I hope this review was helpful and that you guys can go ahead and give it a like and comment and do all that good stuff down below. We did talk about the power requirements, but we didn't actually talk about the, the little plugs. So uh, you will need a six pin PCIe and an eight pin PCIe adapter 
off of your power supply. And like we mentioned before, uh, they recommend a 650 watt power supply for this particular GPU. If you're overclocking, um, I think even that 650 should be fine. What we we're seeing with the soft power pl play tables applied was a 250 on the core, which means we're probably looking at about 275 to 280 total power, somewhere around there. And so with once you add the GPU or once you add the CPU in, um, you are going to be probably over that preferred 50% load at a 650 watt power supply. So consider bumping it up just cause why not? Like that 50% load is the recommended uh, that I consider. So if you add that about 300 plus the other 200 from the CPU and the rest of the components, uh, you, you'd probably be well served to go ahead and bump up to a 150 watt to a thousand watt with overclocking and all that. I will see you next Tuesday.